we all know he can fall over dead. So something had to die. What he was created to be is what died. What the image of God in him is what died. The life of God and the nature of God that was inside of him through that breath is what died. And God made man in his image and God is love. So that means he made man to love. And when Adam sinned, everything he was made to be died, and he got cut off from love, and got cut off from the source of love. Now, God still loved him, but he got disconnected through sin. So man went from being love to needing love. And the Bible says that every man since that day was born into Adam, was born into that deficit. Now, you know as you're sitting there, everybody in this room grew up in need of something from somebody. Insecure. You needed encouraged. You needed accepted. You needed stability. You needed somebody to appreciate you. Come on. They laughed at you in third grade for something you were wearing, and two other children cracked up laughing with them, and you either became broken and introverted or a fighter. Come on. And at a very young age, you were nothing more than a product of how you responded to how it went down. Come on. Why? Because we were all in need of something. We were all in need of love. Now we got to make sure that when this gospel comes, it's not just about him loving us, that we see his love so clear that his love becomes who we are. His love. So it's reciprocated. It's not enough to be loved by God. It's enough to become the love of God. Because that's how he made us in the first place. And Jesus came to save that, not who, that which was lost. Something was lost through sin, and it was man's created value, man's purpose, and man's potential. And I'm telling you, church, on your darkest day, the love of God looked down and said, I know who you are. I know what I created you for. I know what I called you to. I know why you're here. Do you understand there isn't an accident on the planet? That there's a time to be born and life comes from God. He's the author and giver of life. You're not just here because a man went into a woman. You're here because God saw your day before it was ever seen. He said you were predestined before the foundation of the world to be adopted in as his child. He saw you before you were ever seen. He knew you before you were ever known. God is a good God. Listen, I, I want you to just put away living insecure. Put away low esteem. Put away self-consciousness. Let the gospel alone teach you that you're worth the blood of the Son of God. That God sees something greater in you and about you that somebody's judged you in or preferenced you for. You don't find yourself through one another. You find yourself through Him. And only then can you have healthy relationship with one another. Because if you don't find out who you are this way, you'll never be able to steward this way. You'll still have that needy thing. You'll still get let down. You'll still get hurt. You'll still get your feelings all broken. But when you wake up knowing who you are because of who he is in you, it changes everything about the motive of your life. And all of a sudden, you're not driven by need because you've become something. And that's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge is to be filled with the fullness of God. Now, I looked that word fullness up. You know what it means? It means a house with no empty room. Come on. Wow. It means a town with no empty houses. Wow. It means a ship so full of cargo that there ain't no place to put another box. Jesus. It means you're completely and fully occupied. Jesus. And there's no vacancy in your life. Yes. Because you're fulfilled. Yes. To know the... Yes. Not to serve it. Know it. Amen. Jesus said something so amazing in John 17, 3. He said, this is eternal life. That's you right now. 
we can talk about a little in the back. It's still stirred in my heart. It's so powerful to know him. A lot of us have done church and didn't really get to know him. And we let doing church take the place of knowing him. You let your gifting take the place of knowing him. You let your daily devotion take the place of knowing him. You let feeding the hungry or doing a good thing take the place of knowing him. And all of a sudden you're finding your identity through your doing instead of your being. And that's why people run dry. That's why they get tired. And that's why they run out of gas. He's anointed your head and your cup runneth over. Jesus. If somebody's drinking out of your cup, you need to get filled up. See, nobody ever drinks out of my cup. My whole Christian life, I pastor and counsel. I pour myself out to folks. Take so many phone calls, run here, do this, do that. Just trying to cheer somebody on to move forward. But you say, you don't get burned out? I, nobody drinks out of my cup. I'm a cup runner. You're playing in my saucer at best. <laughs> You can't even reach the rim of my cup. He's anointed my head and my cup runs over. Jesus. How can you say that, Pastor? How, you've got to begin. People got to get to you. You've got to burn down. You got to, no, no, no. I'm not ministering out of a ministry mindset. I'm ministering out of a relationship. I'm ministering out of Him. So nobody's drinking out of my cup or I'm going dry. And the more I pour out, the more it's left in. Because it's way better to give than to receive. In fact, if you're receiving all that, you better be giving something. <laughs> I want to share the scripture with you. We talked about it in the back room. It's very convicting. It's, it's very powerful. It says in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. See, because the whole goal of our instruction, 1 Timothy 1, 5, is love. The whole purpose of the commandment is love. He's not talking about you being loved by God. He's talking about you becoming the love of God. It's how they know us by our love. He said, Father, when they, when they become one, like you and I are one, that's when the world will know you sent yourself. I'm telling you, church, there's a time for us to say, you know what? I am buying into this natural knowledge, the way that seemeth right, feelings and emotions that I grew up with. Man, if all things are new and I'm a new creation, I'm going to put off the old, put off that old, and I'm going to put on this something new. And I'm going to become new. I'm going to live from a different place. I'm going to have a different motivation. I'm going to have a different reason for being. I'm done trying to survive. I'm not just believing the Lord to make it. This gospel's not a survival. It's transformation of life. Amen. Yeah? Hallelujah. Yes. He says this in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. Come on. That don't mean rehash each other's weakness and get issues and give quiet treatments and turn yourself off to one another now and then. And we'll get over it. We just have a little fallout right now. No, no, no. Beloved, let us love one another. The word love he's using is agape love. It doesn't seek its own. Glory. Thank you, Lord. That's what makes God's love so powerful, so amazing. Love doesn't seek its own. So it takes no account of the wrong, no account of the wrong done to it. That's why it never fails. That's why on your darkest day, you didn't break God's heart. Come on. He caused grace to abound even more. Because he said, I love you. Amen. And when you see his first love, <laughs> you probably get like this. <laughs> you love him. Oh, yes. And if you never develop that relationship, you get reduced serving wow. instead of knowing him. Instead of living like a bride, you know what you live like? A concubine. Wow. Yes. And you'll brush against his glory now and then. Yeah. Wow. You'll look for a service where you get touched. Wow. That's what a concubine did in the Old Testament. They served the king every once in a great while. That man might have had 700 concubines or something. 
And every once in a while he says, call Jennifer in here. I'm going to spend the night with Jennifer. And Jennifer might not have been in the presence of the king, but he, she served him, but hadn't been in his presence for eight months. Wow. But she served him that whole time. And for one night, she just brushed against the glory of the king. Wow. You know people live their Christian life like that? They live from touch to touch. Instead of being bright. They wait for the next time he touches them. They just run to the altar and hope he touches them to know they're still okay. Mm. What a far away place to live. Come on. You know you're okay because Christ raised from the dead. Hallelujah. And his blood's on the mercy seat speaking better things. Yes. Don't be a concubine. Yeah. Be a bride. Woo. Try to preach first John 4, 7, 8. I'll get there. There's just so much getting in the way. Amen. Better preach. Yes. Preach. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For everyone, everyone who loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Watch. He who loveth not. No, it's not God. He didn't say you don't see your need for a Savior. He didn't say you weren't serious about forgiveness of your sins. He didn't say you weren't a pastor. He didn't say you didn't feed worship. He didn't say you don't serve in the ministry. You don't want a mission to feed the hungry now and then. But here's what he did say. If you don't love, there's one reason. Not two. You don't know him. Which tells me something amazing. I can't know him without being changed by him. This relationship is vital to our lives. It's the relationship you have with Father God through the Son. Isn't it amazing how we always make Jesus the way to heaven? And he didn't even say that. He said, I'm the way back to the Father. Mm. We always make it about heaven. He makes it about the kingdom of God is in hand. Yeah. He said, don't look to here, don't look to there, for the kingdom's within you. What a God. He who loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. What he's saying is he's so powerful, so influential, so transforming, that you can't truly thank you, Ken, on so much. Appreciate the gifts in your time. What he's saying is you can't truly know him without being so influenced by him to express him through. Because that's the goal. He who loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Because all that talks about is love, and talks about us loving one another the way he loved us. And in John, 1 John 4, 17, it says this. We know that love has been perfected in this. Watch this. That we have boldness in the day of judgment. Do you know the Bible says that day is darkness and gloom for many? That it says it's a day of dread? Do you know the Bible says that men will cry out for rocks to fall upon them and trees to smother them, lest they face the glory of His presence? Come on, yeah. And it says for the believer that's been matured in love, it's he has boldness in that day. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Woo. Why do you have boldness? It says because as He is. And the whole chapter, he is love. He is love. He is love. Because as he is, so are we Amen. right now in this world. Amen. Yeah? Yes. Come on, that's so good. Yes. So as a Christian, you got to say, I'm done with offense. I'm done with hurt. Nobody owes me a thing because he gave me the kingdom. I'm fulfilling him. I'm not fulfilling others. I've been looking in the wrong places. I've been trying to find identity through people, and the truth about me rests in him. Amen. So he brings you back to the place you were created to abide from the beginning. Now you've got to understand this to keep walking and growing in this truth. You've got to understand that the blood of Jesus forgives you of all sin. It's not an atonement. He washes it away. Yeah. He didn't cover your sin. He took it away. 
He's the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. First Peter 2 says, He took your sin and my sin in His body on a tree. Anything hanging on a tree has been cursed by God. He did curse Jesus on the cross. He cursed sin in the flesh. And sin shall have no dominion over us. For the law of the spirit of life through Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. So you don't wake up a sinner. You don't wake up trying not to sin. You wake up a son, a daughter. You wake up righteous, accepted in the beloved. You gotta put him on. And you gotta wake up in what he accomplished. And if you don't start where he finished, you'll never run well. And you'll try to accomplish something that's already done. You'll take your own test, you'll grade your own scores. Because your heart's sincere, you'll feel like you failed. And you'll allow yourself to be deceived and condemned. Or, you can put on righteousness. And you can thank God that you're clean and free in Him. And you got nothing to prove the joy of becoming. And all of a sudden, grace empowers you and righteousness produces its fruit to holiness. Amen. All of a sudden, there's a holy expression coming through your life without you biting your lip trying to be a holy. So all the glory goes to Him. And what you are is by the grace of God and there's no boasting in men. That's how powerful the gospel works. But sin consciousness will never take you. Yes. You've got to recognize that He bore your sin and my sin in His body on the tree. It says in 1 John 2, and if we sin, not when, if, and if we sin, we have an advocate. He's Jesus the righteous. And he's mercy over our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. Now the world has to repent. The world has to repent and receive him as their king, their savior. But that's why you can pray for somebody that's not saved and see them healed. I've seen it countless times in my life because I approach people. I, I, I pull over my car more times than I can remember just to pray for somebody. It freaks them out because you pull over the car. They think it's radical Christianity. Radical Christianity. You see somebody in pain and hurting, and you feel like there's something inside you called Jesus that can help their situation. You think it's radical because I park my car to pray for them? I'll tell you what's radical. A long time ago, God became a man and died on the cross. He was totally innocent and became guilty so we could go free, so he could put his life in me. That's radical. Amen. Stop in the car to pray for them is a given. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Jesus. Why? Because you love not your own life unto death. You don't seek your own. You seek what's his. You pull over your car and you say, excuse me, you look like you're in so much pain. I've had people look at me and they say, well, I really don't believe what you're saying. Like, I don't even know if I believe in God. I say, that's okay. I just want to pray for you. Would you let me pray? I believe. See, because my Bible doesn't say these signs shall follow those who you pray for that believe. Your Bible says these signs shall follow those that believe. That would be the one that's parking his car. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> it's not that's so much fun in my life. Countless memories. I travel all the time through airports. I stop folks. I say, excuse me. Man, are you okay? You look like you're really in pain. Oh, man, I'm in pain. I've been taking such and such, but it ain't working today. Can I just have your hand? Excuse me? I just want to see your hand. Man. Can I have your hand? <laughs> they think you're going to read your palm or something. They don't know what you're doing. <laughs> You don't even mention Jesus. Something about just enough church to try to talk you out of faith. You just take their hand. Because once I got their hand, it's too late. <laughs> I can pray. You see? Guys, we can all live this way. But you know what? We're not going to live this way if we're living insecure. If we still need encouragement, somebody say something nice. If we're looking for reputation or praise. Man, I ain't looking for none of that. I'll lay down my life so he can live in it for me. And ain't nobody I'm looking at right now and I'll ever look at in the surf that owes me a thing. You can't break my heart because you didn't fix it. <laughs> you don't owe me a thing. I'm 23 years into this thing. So I'm either in a fantasy and the most deceived man you ever met or I'm free. 
I got all my chips on free. We'll find out one day. <laughs> but all my chips are pushed on free space. <laughs> see, you just see me on the weekend, but I live with you. <laughs> and I know who I've become on the inside. And there was a day when I didn't even like me. And I needed you to say something nice to believe I was like you. Wow. And I would live for your attention to try to prove that I was like I fed off of it, like a lot of people do when they have low esteem. And I didn't like me, but he loved me. And he said, that ain't you, boy. And his words are before the throne all the time. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. But if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me, he said, didn't he? And he drew me to himself, and he took the blinders and the lies off of me. He said, I love you, boy. I loved you from the beginning. You're so much more than you've ever understood. Jesus. And he began to teach me who I am in him. Jesus. And, and it got me free. You know what it got me free from? It got me free from me. Yes. Me living for me. He needing for me. Me wanting for me. Yeah. And when I got free from me, guess who else I got free from since I got free from me? You. I got free from you. <laughs> so when I got free from me, I was finally released to love you, not need you. Yeah. So the days of you breaking my heart and let me down and discouraged me ended 23 years ago. You said you lived this way for 23 years. I promise you I've lived this way for 23 years. Jesus taught me this. You think I haven't experienced life like we've experienced life? You think everybody's always done me right? They don't live for you to do me right. I live to love you and manifest Jesus. I wake up to shine, not to treat you right. Wow. <laughs> I wake up to shine, yeah. not be treated right. I ain't getting tricked back into that me, myself, and I thing. The day you owe me something is the day I'm deceived. Because I owe no man anything but to love. Yes. Come on. And love takes no account yeah. of the wrong done to it. So why are we so busted up by each other? Wow. Why we got so many issues and memories and stories? Come on. Why have some of us become hardened? And why have some of us put up walls and defense and protection and live leery? <laughs> you put up a wall, you're just subject to be overtaken. Somebody's coming over that wall. <laughs> you probably ought to take it down. You think Jesus lived that way? No. <laughs> he lived that the way that he lived because he was loved. identity that he paid for you to be free from. Thank you, Lord. The Bible doesn't say that it's humble to say, you know, we're not perfect. We always go to slip and fall. You're just setting yourself up to slip and fall so you're denying a grace that might change your experience. Come on. Not saying perfect, but wonder if the grace of God can come in your life and actually cause you to live more consistent, live in longer seasons of just a clear conscience without stumbling. Jesus. And yet you're expecting to fail because you think it's humble to just call yourself flesh when he told you to live by the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what do you do with that? What do you do with a scripture like that? Live by the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. To live by the Spirit is to live by truth. It's not a spooky thing. It's not do 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 To live by the Spirit is to live by truth. His word is spirit and life. He's the spirit of truth. Yes. Yeah? So if you live by the truth and you keep your eyes fixed on who you've become now that he came, it'll keep you from living in the flesh. But if you don't see how he sees you, you won't have the confidence to continually approach him with an unveiled face and you'll get self-conscious and feel like maybe you ain't worthy, you haven't lived up to it. Next thing you know, your intimacy is lacking. Next thing you know, you're doing Jesus stuff without being with him. Don't ever let that happen to none of you. Never let that happen to any of you. Because we 
when you're with him is when you changed. When you're with him is when you become loved. Are you good? Yes. I want to show you something very powerful. Because the Bible, oh man, is that my same girl up there that was so good today with that screen? That's you, ain't it? You're good. You're quick, too. Could you do me a favor? Could you, could you pop up there 1 John chapter 1? 1 John chapter 1, start in verse 5. And if I could have the New King James Version, I would so appreciate it. Just because that's what I read from and I'm familiar with. That way I'll be quoting what's back there. You got it up there already? You are so <laughs> Did you ever hear somebody say, out of context, actually? Did you ever hear anybody say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and, and make him a liar or the truth's not in us? Yes. Yep. And we quote a one-liner like that a lot. People quote that stuff. And then somebody starts talking on grace or talks about, there's even people out there preaching a grace that's unscriptural. They're preaching a grace that says, oh, well, God loves us no matter what. Well, God loves us, that's period. But that doesn't give you a permission slip to remain the same. That should actually inspire you to receive change. Yeah. Yes. Like James chapter 3, verse 13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him prove by the good conduct of his life that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have envy or self-seeking in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. What he's saying is self-centeredness is never acceptable in the kingdom. It can never produce kingdom fruit because it's all part of the fall and it's what we became through Adam. Do you realize we were trained in a lie? We were taught by false things. I call it homeschooling the wrong home. We had the wrong classes. You just by sheer instinct reacted in life. And it wasn't long where you flared up with feelings and hostility and anger or insecurity or brokenness. That stuff just came natural to all of us. You didn't have to work at it. Why? Because something got perverted when Adam sinned and got cut off from God. And Jesus wants to restore it. And, and he calls it new life and born again. And we've turned born again into a prayer that takes me to heaven instead of the transformation and restoration of life. Born again is as if I never lived before. I'm born again. Come on. Yeah? The old is gone, baptized, dead, buried with him. Amen. As Christ was raised by the glory of the Father, we also raised in the newness of life. It's Romans 6. It's right there. I read the book. It's powerful. Man, by faith you're going to die. By your spirit you live. Yeah? You're not asking me into your heart. You're not praying a prayer in case you drive into a tree tonight. <laughs> That's how we present the gospel all the time. And we make it a self-serving thing. Something that gives me something instead of makes me something. That's true. What good does it do to get your name in a book of life and go to heaven forever and live in the same anger, the same frustration, the same discouragement, the same attitude as before you prayed the prayer to go to heaven? How is that influential? How is that light shining? How is that going to evangelize and cause somebody to want what they see in your life? Come on, I'm just being straight. Don't be, that's not hard. That's transforming. We've got to make sure that we understand. In all of our getting, get understanding, we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So let's preach the clearest gospel and get selfishness driven far from our lives. Yeah? He says, if you have selfishness in you, in James, don't boast and lie against the truth. What he's saying is don't appear to be something you're not allowing grace to cause you to become. Don't hide through emotions. Deal with your heart. Get alone with God. Challenge that thing and call it dead and go this way. He says, because this wisdom, selfishness, this wisdom never descended from above. It was God's idea to make us love. It was the devil's idea to twist and pervert our creative value and make every man for himself. Wow, that's true. So see, when, when, when man sinned in the garden, he didn't just sin. He took on the nature of God's enemy. Wow. And love took a 180 and became self-centered. He said, Adam, why were you hiding from me? Uh, Lord, I was... 
I was ashamed because I was naked and I was ashamed, so I, I came over here. How did you know you were naked, Adam? Did you eat the tree that I forbid you to eat? It's a yes or no question. Who would agree? Yeah. He could say yes or no. Guess what he said? It was the woman you gave me for she gave me to eat. What's he saying? If you wouldn't have gave me the woman, I probably wouldn't have ate the tree. So to work it out. <laughs> he couldn't even take responsibility. It's the first effect of sin. Blame shifting. Self-righteousness. Self-defense. Self-justification. Self-protection. At the cost of God and at the cost of the woman. What is this woman you've done? It was the serpent he gave me to eat. What's she saying? It was the devil. He made me do it. <laughs> Try your Bible. You don't have to go far. Genesis 3 to see the first effects of sin. What was made to be love become bankrupt and became in need of love and became totally self-centered. You get to the book of Job and you got the devil quipping back to God. It's, it's startling to me. We ought to read this stuff and go, man, that ain't going to be my life. But in, in a lot of cases, I'm sad to announce that the devil's right in a lot of cases. You've got to make sure he's not right where you're concerned. Because here's what he says to God. He says, Job, upright? Are you kidding me? Upright. He, he's talking to God. The devil, confident and cocky, as if he's got it all figured out. He's upright. He said the only reason he blesses you is because you blessed him. You hedged him in. You made this guy fat in the land. Like, no wonder he is the way he is. Look what you've done for him. You take away the blessing and you'll see. He'll curse you to your face just like every other man. That is good. What's he saying? He's saying, You're, he's only treating you the way he is because of the way you treated him. Has nothing to do with integrity. Has nothing to do with selflessness. So all that stuff gets taken. He said, all that he has is in your hands. A lot of people preach that God smoked you. It's not scriptural. All that he has is in your hands. So what's he saying? Why are you asking permission? Why are you... This man's under sin. There's no blood of Jesus. There's no covenant. That's right. Is there? No. Men are reaping what they sow. Yeah. Is Job completely blameless or at some level has all fallen short? Have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Yes. All that he has is in your hand. Job's paying alms and, 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 and offerings to God every day for fear because he's afraid. He's fearing for his kids. Yes. He's doing things. There's a lot involved in that story. Yes. He's not trusting God. He's not praying mercy over his children. He's trying to pick up the slack for them because he's scared something bad's happened. Yes. And something bad came. Yeah. And what he feared the most yeah. came upon him. Yeah. And you got Jesus. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. So after all this stuff gets stripped away, and Job's confused. There's a lot going on if you read the language. But he doesn't disown God and curse God. The devil comes back to God. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? That he's lost all these things and he hasn't cursed me. He's, he's full of integrity. He won't, he's not like other men. He said, skin for skin. He said, a man. This is what the devil said to God. A man will give anything to save What's he saying? You made man to love, and that's laying down your life for others. I perverted what you made, and you saw it that day. And now they're all like me. They'll do anything to preserve themselves. Amen. That's intense. You better make sure he ain't right with you. Jesus comes strolling on the earth, man. Matthew 16, if any man come after me. Let him make sure he prays a prayer and goes to heaven in case he hits a tree on the way home. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, if any man come after me, let him first deny himself. Why? You were never made for him. You were made for his image. And I'm convinced the biggest problem on the planet is every day, Christians and non-Christians wake up living for themselves when instead, 
why would God fill your tank to drive down a road you weren't called to? People say life's a grind, life's a bleed, life's a blank. Life's a gift. Amen. And the only reason it's a grind is because you're living it outside of why you're here. Right. That's why you're receiving no grace to live. Are you with me? No. Well, this isn't hard. It's life giving. It's even if you fit this thing, you go, oops, duh. And just switch right over. I'm done living that way. I'm done thinking that. I'm done needing that. I'm done. Come on. I want to read you something that Espinel knows. Because we take this stuff out of context. But I want you, I want you to see what it actually says. Who's ever heard if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and make him alive? So in other words, when people preach that out of context, what they're preaching is you always have the guilt of sin, the consciousness of sin, the awareness of sin. And if you have no sin, if you say you have no sin, that means you're always with sin. Well, it can't mean that. Because he's, he's, he's the lamb that so if he takes it away, how can you have it? So he can't mean that. So don't let no preacher preach one-liners and make them say what it sounds like without reading before and after and read it in context. Because that thing has hurt folks right there, that one scripture. And we use that one line out of context and people get deceived into a sin consciousness when they're supposed to be wrecked and dead to sin and alive unto God. It's true. How can you walk in righteousness if you're full of sin awareness? How can you present yourself a member under righteousness? You know what righteous, righteousness means? Not guilty. As if you've never sinned. No sense of guilt, condemnation, and shame before God. Wow. He rules his kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. <laughs> the strength of his kingdom is hinged on not guilty. Don't let nobody talk you in to being what he paid for you to be free from. Jesus. Because when your heart cares, you've been changed. When you care, you're alive inside. Now, I've had people come to me crying. I said, Pastor, we need to talk. I said, okay, we get along. I said, it's okay, just talk to me. And they tell me some bad thing they just did. And I'm not ignoring it. We'll deal with it in a minute. But here's how I always end it. They're crying, they're tore up. You ever see this? Do you ever have somebody come and open up their heart to you and confess something to you? And you can see they're broken? I look at them, I say, man, I'm sure glad to see how the gospel's purified your heart. And they say, purify my heart, did you hear what I just said I did? Well, I heard what you did, but I see who you are. And the trouble is, if you identify with what you did and fail to see who you are through what he did, You'll live a vicious cycle and you'll mar the identity of this tree. And if you don't think the tree's good, the fruit can never be good. But if we can make the tree good, the fruit's automatic. So it's not that this is okay, but believing this is who you are is the biggest lie of your life. And you're on thin ice right now. If you take this into your identity instead of this. Yeah? yeah. That's just good pastor. Yeah. It just is. Watch this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is love. Now where does he live? Light. In us by his spirit, right? And he's life. And in him is no darkness. <laughs> and where does he live? Me. Oh, next verse, please. <laughs> if we say we have fellowship, communion, koinonia, communion with the Lord, and we walk in darkness. That means just continue to practice darkness. We lie and don't practice the truth. In other words, you can't have both. So if you're trapped in a way where you're practicing darkness, don't get condemned. Don't give up. You go after the Lord. You start renouncing things. You start putting off things in prayer. You start believing God's grace is sufficient. You put that desire on the altar. Whatever. You deal with it because your heart is alive inside. Yeah. Right? So you have fellowship with God. The whole idea of having co-union and communion with God is so we don't walk in deliberate or continual darkness so we can shine as lights. This thing's all about light. Amen. Why? Because light is greater 
Darkness. In darkness, darkness is never the problem. Ever. You say, oh man, gangs are rising up. Man, there's so much murder. There's so much, there's so much darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is never the problem. Nobody ever walked into a super bright room and said, hey man, can you turn up the darkness? <laughs> if the room gets darker, it's just somebody turned down the light. And ye are the light of the world. So let your light so shine before men that they see your life lived and go, wow, there's a God. Yeah? Let your beats just receiving a blessing. Come on. Don't get me after you now. If we say we fellowship with him and we'll walk in darkness, we lie and we're not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, so we come out of darkness in the light, we see our need for a savior, we come out of darkness in the light, right? We have fellowship, koinonia, communion with one another. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. Now hold it right there for a second, honey. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from some sin. So in that verse, right there, verse 7, last line, are you getting cleansed of all sin? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and you're walking in the light, you're coming out of darkness so you can walk in the light, have fellowship with him, and his blood, it's a place of repentance, it's your born again experience. Watch this next verse. This is the one that gets quoted out of context constantly. If we say we have no sin, now he'll repeat that two verses later and clarify it. See, that's why we better keep reading. Read above, read below. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What's he saying? He's saying if you say you have no need for the blood. Mm. Wow. Does every man have a need for the blood? Amen. Has all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Yeah. But that verse before, do you think he's talking about perpetual, continual sin? Or is he talking about the need for a savior? Because he mentions the blood. And if we say we have no sin, we're deceived because we all need the blood. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now watch. So in verse 7, it said we were cleansed of all sin. Remember? If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful. Faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So in verse 7, we're cleansed of all sins. In verse 9, we're forgiven of our sins. And we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. Now, I might not be the brightest man on the planet, but if I'm cleansed of all unrighteousness, what's left? Righteousness. Righteousness. <laughs> wow, I can get this. Verse 10. Here, now he clarifies verse 8. He repeats it, but the language changed just a tiny bit. They put a T on the end of no. Verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, he clarifies it. Listen, if we say we have not sin, he reiterates it. He's saying, don't you fall in that self-righteous trap and think you can get to God without the blood. Yeah. Don't you think you can save yourself? Don't you get self-righteous and so arrogant and live deceived and think your own works are sufficient? He's saying, if we say we have not sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But if we say we sin, the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin, forgives us and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Now watch, chapter 2, verse 1. If you could do that for me, that's the next verse. It's all one letter. I wish we wouldn't have chopped it all up into chapters. It's just called a one big letter. But if you could, it's 1 John 2, verse 1. Watch, watch. My little children, these things I write to you so you may not sin. Yes. Amen. So what do you think he's saying? But you're always going to, and if you're saying you're not, you're deceived and a liar. Right. Ha! Why is he, what's the whole purpose of the last things that he wrote? That to know. teach you righteousness, and if you humble yourself under the mighty head of God and confess your sin and come out from under your sin, he will cleanse you of all sin, and you'll have fellowship with one another because you're walking in the light as he's in the light. Little children, I'm writing this to you so you don't go on just thinking you're perpetual sin. I'm writing it so you 